They were slinging slime in prime time with the second presidential debate canceled. ABC and NBC held simultaneous, yeah, town hall meetings on Thursday night. Biden on ABC, Trump on NBC. I was on XTC. At one town hall, this is what you got. The scientists will disagree with the economists. So the question is, how are you going to decide this? Who are you going to listen to? And how can you can contain the pandemic without crushing the economy? Well, you can contain the pandemic by being rational and not crush the economy. How civil. But meanwhile, at the other. A couple of days later, on a different show, oh, you, you, you denounced white this. supremacy. No, you My question to you is, You've done this to why me does and everybody, it seem like... I denounced white supremacy, okay? You did I've two days later. I've denounced white supremacy for years, but you always do it. You always start off with the well, question. You didn't ask Joe Biden whether or not he denounces Antifa. What a contrast. On one screen, you had Perry Como and Kenny G. On the other, Bride of Chucky. More, please. Mr. Vice President, if you lose, what will that say to you about where America is today? Well, it could say that I'm a lousy candidate and I didn't do a good job. I just don't know about QAnon. You do know. I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't know. Will you demand that President Trump take a test that day and that it be negative before you debate? Yeah. By the way, before I came up here, I took another test. I've been taking it every day. Disavow QAnon yeah. in its entirety? I know nothing about QAnon. I just told I you. I know very little. You told me, but what you tell me doesn't necessarily make it fact. Wow. It's like comparing a lullaby to death metal. Fun fact, Savannah Guthrie asked Trump over 40 questions, but only got to 10 questions from the town hall voters, which it was for, including one who said this. I have to say, you have a great smile. <laughs> Got you. Okay. Thank As, you. So, he <laughs> does. You're so handsome when you smile. Well, I didn't expect that, but now we've learned two questioners at the Biden town hall have Democratic ties. One was a speechwriter in Obama's Commerce Department. The other's married to a Pennsylvania Democrat involved in local politics. Meanwhile, Steph pressed Biden on court packing. He's going to get back to us on that. And no mention of the Hunter stuff. So it's hard to say what we got from the town halls other than a raging headache. This was me Friday morning. Leo. Leo. Papa. Mira. <laughs> wow. All right, Emily, which one did you watch? Which one do you record? Um, oh, well, I started with Tucker, actually, and then I watched the Trump one, of course, because we all knew how the Biden one was going to play out. But I feel like Savannah, like the, the town hall, it was sort of like if a friend calls you and is like, oh, hey, how are you? So what's up? And then two minutes in is like, look, I wanted to talk to you about something that you said the other night because this was supposed to be a town hall. But actually, it was Savannah's private personal boxing match that she was trying to engage with. And if the whole point of a town hall is for us, the viewers, to hear thoughtful questions from other American citizens and hear thoughtful answers, I mean, this is just one more example of those participants in the mainstream media who are like self-anointed white knights and who are taking it upon themselves to carry justice for all of us and instead just missing the mark about what we all want to hear. Yeah, I was getting, Tyrus, I was getting the impression that she wasn't asking questions for the American people, but she wanted to make sure she got good reviews from her media friends and people in the media who hate Trump. Yeah, that probably was her uh, agenda. Let's, let's just keep it real. But whose fault is that? Mm -hmm. Like Anytime any one of us agrees to uh, interview with the media, <laughs> we always have a plan. And if it's not the way we're going, we pull out or we right. don't answer. The one thing we don't do is over answer. And I was flipping back and forth. Both, both candidates over answered. The difference was is that Trump became annoyed and mm -hmm. combative and became very personal. And then once it became personal and he gets an argument, the reporter wins. And as savvy and as intelligent as our president is, he allowed himself to get in a one-on-one -on -one battle with a reporter. And I'm telling you right now, I don't care who you are or how mm -hmm. slick you are, you're never going to win mm -hmm. because they're just going to keep baiting you. And he took the bait, which was very disappointing, honestly. He, at this point in the game, you know, do with the white supremacy question, straight up, you say it and you move on. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need to explain himself, and he always seems to fall for that loop where they try to, like, well, you didn't, you didn't uh, yeah. do it fast enough. 
-hmm. you know, while I'm doing it now. Next question. What did you make of it, Kat? Well, I actually thought when it came to the line of questioning for Biden that it was relatively tough compared to some of the questioning I've seen of him in the past, uh, keeping in mind that the bar for tough questions when it comes to reporters and Biden is on the ground and yeah. like the ground is made of my pillows. I, <laughs> I will never forget when he gave that speech about his you know, economic plan and the reporter goes to ask a question and says, how are you so calm and how do you handle it so well when Trump is so mean to you? That's your question. And it's really upsetting <laughs> because I don't care if you're vetting someone to be in a huge position of power or that person is in a position of power. They should be getting tough questions. I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat or even the greatest politician who's ever lived and my celebrity crush, Ron Paul. Same thing, <laughs> because it's an, it is it's true. It is an important check on government power that keeps us free. And if this is how it would be with a Biden presidency, that's something that makes me very concerned. You know, uh, um, Charlie, uh, I do think the imbalance what was, is what was most striking, but we knew that was coming. I think it was, this is all about uh, um, Savannah Guthrie taking the heat off NBC for even having Trump. This, she was, this was her job to say, oh, yeah, we're having him, but we're going to barbecue him. Yeah, no, absolutely, uh, no doubt about it. But I also think that, you know, that, that that's where Trump excels, does his best. He shows his, his truest colors is during combative interviews. And I think he does a lot better in a lot of combative interviews than he does with friendly ones. I tried to watch the Biden thing, and it literally put me to sleep. It was so boring. And then and then you also had this weird setup where you had the audience members that were that were elevated up in the stands talking down to him and Biden was looking up and it was like he was watching angels in the room <laughs> and answering and talking and you couldn't tell who he's talking to. It was the strangest thing. And then of course if you listen to what he said, uh, you know, he was he kept talking about programs and stuff that he and Barack had done and also and it, I, to me it was just such a turnoff. And, uh, and tedious, and it reminds me that, you know, when Donald Trump is gone, I'm going to quit covering politics. I don't <laughs> want to cover, go back to covering regular politicians. They bore the hell out of me. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's kind of like when you were caught smoking as a kid. Your parents made you smoke two packs in a row so you'd hate it. But I think Trump has forced America to smoke two packs of politics. Like, just like, here, you want this stuff every freaking day. I'm going to make you smoke politics, and you're never going to want to go near it again. Because I agree. I feel like walking off into the sunset with a vape.